to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Today we recommit to love all, unborn and born. Today we receive the sunrise from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Today we proclaim, repent and believe the good news that Jesus Christ, conceived by the Spirit, formed in the womb and born of the Virgin Mary, died and rose for sinners. That includes all of us. Today we give thanks for John, who preached repentance and pointed to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Today, we lovingly invite all to listen to Jesus' call, repent and believe in the gospel. If you have caused an abortion, taking of life, there is forgiveness in Jesus. Don't be hardened in sin or advocate for more sins. Today, you have hope in the one whose way John the Baptist prepared. Jesus is for sinners. Come join the rest of us forgiven sinners. Jesus is for you. You need not have a bad conscience. Repent and believe the good news of God's love for you in Jesus. Today we lament that the U.S. Supreme Court continues to deny the unborn the legally recognized right to life. Even though Roe v. Wade has fallen, states can still allow the killing of unborn children. Today we pray that more unborn will leap with joy in the womb, as St. John did. Today, even as we rejoice, we weep that U.S. policy continues to promote abortion globally. Today we bend our knees in prayer. O Lord, let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The Lord preceded his Son, our Savior, with a forerunner. We pray that today's decision points ahead to the day when every state advances the cause of life, and expands protections for unborn children. Lord, have mercy upon us. Matthew C. Harrison, President of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. There we go. All right. There we go. So, yep, very nice uh, letter written by our president uh, to keep kind of the bigger picture of things, right? It's not about the law, but it's also about the gospel, right? Uh, our values... Uh, for those who are born and unborn comes from Jesus, right? It comes from Jesus, who also was unborn, yet still among us uh, as a Savior in Mary's womb. And that makes our life from conception to natural end precious and valuable in God's sight and in ours. And so my encouragement is that we always remember uh, that big picture, the picture of the gospel, and not argue on the base of law, especially as Christians, right? It's not my point, my job to teach government class to you, right? But, uh, but to teach the truth of God's word, and to encourage, to uh, call us all to repentance, to proclaim the forgiveness of sins, and to uh, uphold what the scripture says about all of life. And I pray that uh, God will grant each of you wisdom and, uh, and that these conversations, you will have opportunity to share the gospel. Uh, a lot of people are afraid, hurting, uh, and uh, unfortunately are getting a little stirred up uh, in response uh, to this uh, decision. And it need not be. It need not be. We focus on God who cares for us from all of us. And uh, speak to hurt, to fear, and to the truth. So, with that, any questions? Any questions? There's other uh, things on the same website. Uh, uh, a fuller letter uh, from uh, the, the Life uh, uh, Ministries uh, of the Missouri Senate, which is, again, an excellent read. Uh, so. All right. One. One question. Okay, let's get to our topic of the All right. Hezekiah's Song of Recovery. So, Isaiah chapter 38. So, we're going to cover the context of Hezekiah's Song. 
And we're going to spend a little bit of time, especially on the title of Hezekiah's song, so we understand you know, what kind of song this is. Then, of course, we're going to delve deeper into the actual song that Hezekiah sings, and then give some final thoughts and applications. So, here we go. The context of Hezekiah's song. In particular, a previous dilemma and deliverance for King Hezekiah, and then moving into the current dilemma that Hezekiah faces. All right, so this is kind of meant to be a review. Uh, so you can flip to Isaiah chapters 36 and 37 uh, as kind of like a, a little quick uh, review or recall what we've talked about uh, last week or two uh, or three. Okay. What was the previous dilemma that King Hezekiah faced? Anyone remember? Chapters 36 and 37. What was the previous dilemma, the hard situation? Uh, Syria. Yeah, Syria, right, or Assyria, like there's a huge army coming up at the doorstep of Jerusalem, up to the walls. They had already destroyed a lot of the, uh, uh, the kingdoms surrounding them, and now they're coming up at their doorstep, right? And things don't look good, right? No one has been able to stop the king of Assyria and his army, right? And the king of Assyria points that out. No God can deliver from the king of Assyria and his army. Hmm, hmm, hmm. The last words, right, that uh, he should uh, ever speak, right? Because who delivered King Hezekiah? Who delivered him from this tight spot? Who delivered him? God did, right? How? I remember how? It was the end of chapter 37. How did God deliver King Hezekiah? He sent an airstrike. <laughs> okay, well, kind of, right? He sent the angel of death, which reminds me of a fun story. We tried in one of our exercises to call in an airstrike uh, in one of our exercises. Yeah, we definitely sent it upon our own. And, and you know, say, like, but that's why we learn. That's why we practice. We make adjustments, right? And in a safe environment, these are good mistakes to make. And so we learn from and make adjustments. So anyway, I just, uh, that, that came to my mind. But it said the angel of the Lord, who does not make mistakes, who does not have failure in communication, and does not need training, right? The Lord sent his angel of death upon the camp and completely destroyed the army, right? And they, uh, the kings fled town, my back home. All right. What lessons could King Hezekiah learn from this experience? What should have King Hezekiah learned? Where to go to for help. Okay, number one answer, right? When you are in need and need help, where do you turn to? Right? Turn to the Lord. Right? Number one answer, right? Because no one, no one was able to deliver... Uh, themselves out of you know King Sennacherib's hands. No one could defeat him. Only God. Yeah, did. What about what lessons can you learn based on that little previous uh, dilemma and deliverance? What lessons can we learn? So do the same, right? Trust in the Lord. We are in a tight spot. When you are in a tight spot. When things look beyond your power and control, you ever feel like you're in over your head uh, with uh, things that are beyond your own control, right? Do you just wallow in pity and just sit in a corner and curl up in a ball and drool from the mouth? Okay, maybe sometimes we are tempted to do that. Or maybe curl up in a ball and complain about the world and the way it is. No, we turn unto Lord, and we trust him to deliver us. All right. Great lesson, right? Easy on paper, right? Hard in life. And you know who also faced that? King Hezekiah. Isaiah chapter 38. So uh, can someone read uh, the situation at hand, the context, 
Uh, Isaiah chapter 38, verses 1 through 8. In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion, and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add fifteen years to your life, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps that has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the ten steps it had gone down. All right. Okay, have you ever had two big dilemmas ever hit you back to back? Like two nasty things, two tight spots, back to back. When it rains, it pours. When it rains, it pours, right? Uh, or sometimes we say back to back to back. Uh, in, in some churches we have the saying, good things happen in threes. And bad things also happen in threes, right? Um, you know, when, when thinking about the last time two really big dilemmas ever hit you back to back, was the first dilemma resolved? You know, when, those, when two big things happened to you, was the first one resolved when the second hit? Sometimes yes. Most of the time, no. Right? There's still some things happening in the first thing when the second one hits. Um, how did you feel or respond when the second one hit you? Whoa, Come on! Come on! <laughs> All right. To who? To God. To God. Okay. That's an interesting way to start a prayer. You know, uh, if only in the Psalms it says, Oh Lord, come on! <laughs> Exclamation point. Y'all. Y'all. Right? Maybe that's what the hoy is for uh, that we talked about earlier with the woe, right? You know, that uh, maybe that's the ah that it says, the A-H exclamation point uh, in some of our Bibles, right? In, in our English language, it would be, come on. Okay. All right, how else did you feel or respond when the second one hit you? Start looking for the third one. Start looking for the third one. Okay. Uh, as we know, uh, or as some of us have experienced, now we're, we're, we're very hesitant, right? We're very, like, aware, right? We're looking around like, okay, something else may happen. Right? You may get a little what, paranoid uh, or watchful. Any other ways to describe that feeling when you're kind of looking for a third? Hmm? Things coming in three. Three? Things come in three. So how do you feel? Like what's that what's that feeling in your heart or mind that comes up? Yeah. Dread. Uh, I heard a, a response that was very well put. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Any others? How about repentance? How about like, okay, Lord, I've got a wake-up call. Help me, right? And if I've ever trusted in anything other, help me to trust in you, because I can't save myself from this. Right? You know, we want to be on good terms with God, right? We want to make sure that our relationship with the Lord is healthy, because we know that, or we anticipate that a third thing may come. Then. Uh, what are the blessings and temptations when double dilemmas hit God's people? All right. So let's start with the temptations. What are the temptations when double dilemmas hit God's people? Just to give up. Give up. The temptation is to give up. Yeah. Or to become like the ungrateful servant who called God harsh. Okay, we may call God harsh, or we might become ungrateful servants. Uh, any other temptations when double dilemmas hit us? Yeah. Uh, to assume that we must be doing something wrong. Ooh. Like we're being punished for something, we've done something to deserve it. Mm. Or to think that about others. It's like easier to think that about others. 
Okay. Yes. Uh, a lot of times, right, even in the Bible, right, there are instances where the disciples are like, hey, which, who sinned, this person or the parents, right? You know, what this person is uh, born blind, right? And there are times where, you know, we see that in other people, right? And that's a temptation, right? That's a, a wrong kind of thought. But we may even have that for ourselves, or even Job's friends. We're like, all right, Job, what did you do wrong? Right? Uh, what particular sin do you need to cut out so that you uh, can get out of this? Right. Yeah? My mom always used to say, God can't get your attention while you're standing up and put you flat on your back. Okay. And so, like with the repentance, maybe just reflection and then yes. speak in the Lord's face. Or, right. there's the other side, turning completely against him. Right. Yeah, that there's a time where instead of focusing on one thing, Right, and saying, okay, if I get rid of this one thing in my life, it will be bad. Right? Instead, think about it in terms of, and this is where it comes into a blessing, right? As you're saying, right? Is that when we realize that we cannot save ourselves, or we think about like repentance in the wide, fullest perspective, right? That say, I, I need to trust in you. And uh, for all the times where I haven't, you know, please, Lord, forgive and help me, right? That change of mind. A change of heart says, I'm not going to rely on myself. I need to rely on me. Right? And I would say that would be a blessing. Right? Because that's how God strengthens our faith. Right? Uh, that's how God really blesses our faith. Any other blessings? Uh, when double the lungs hit past people. Yeah. Well, we can't always see it at the time, but sometimes God uses those things for, for good. When you think about Joseph, Mm -hmm. He might have one, two, three. I mean, his brothers <clears throat> sold him into slavery, and then Pharaoh put him in prison. I mean, he didn't have a good start there, right? No. Um, but it ended up working out for good. Mm -hmm. So sometimes God uses those double dilemmas to get us in this position for the better thing. Okay. Yeah, he puts us in position for good. Yeah. I, I think when I look back over my life, a lot of the, the bad things that happened, didn't have to figure out what God had going on. He was a potter. You know, he, those, those dilemmas were, were were things that God was using to form me as a person. I didn't have to figure it out. You know, I was I was going to be what he was going to make me. And that's those things that uh, happened were things that shaped my attitudes and who I am. It wasn't that I made a conscious decision that I'm going to think about this this way. It's that, you know, the, the potter smacked me upside the head and it made me look out. <laughs> okay, so it, it wasn't so much that, uh, uh, you know, it, I guess it, what I'm saying was it, it's not so much an intellectual exercise you do. It's, it's more God is making you who, you who he wants you to be. And if it takes uh, bad things happening, you know, if it takes a wife to death's door and getting laid off and, and uh, having a toddler and a newborn baby at home at the same time, that's what it takes. Yeah. Yeah. And the Lord is shaping and molding the whole way. Yeah. A lot of times people will say that which does not kill us makes us stronger. Yeah. But really, that's not a good way to look at it. Because what we need to be seeing is that we are stronger, not what made us stronger. But, you know, don't focus on like the pain that made us stronger but that we are stronger. We don't know. God answers, you know, our prayers, yes, no, and wait. Wait always feels like no. Mm -hmm. And then when you get that wait, like 10 years later when you have a daughter, you know, <laughs> then, then it's an incredible, you know, insight. It's like you said, you don't know who might be touched by what you're going through. Mm -hmm. You know, just like Joe is touched so many people because of the suffering he's put through. Was it his fault? No. No. You're right. Good. All right. So let's get to the second dilemma. All right. So verse one. What was Hezekiah's second dilemma? He was dying, deathly ill, and to make that abundantly clear, what did he get in verse one? How did the 
prophet came to him. And the said, prophet hey, actually came, die, right? Sure, to him. Said, like, hey, by the way, you're not feeling great? Well, let me just tell you why, right? <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die, you shall not recover. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, right? I wonder if he said that. Probably not. <laughs> oh, me? What? Come on. All right, come on. All right. He wasn't feeling well, and God made it abundantly clear. You're going to die. You're not recovering from this. And what is he telling him to do? Make sure your affairs are in order. Right? Make sure your affairs are in order. Yeah. How did Hezekiah respond? Verses 2 and 3. Yeah. Usually, not like usually, the first thing you mention 
it's not just a sign to him. It's a sign to everyone. Yeah. The stairway of Ahaz 
is built up, it's actually built as a sundial. Mm -hmm. So not just he saw it, everybody saw it. Right. And who proclaimed this? Right? Who explained it? Isaiah. 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 Right? This is public or will become public knowledge. Right? Isaiah declares it in front of the king. You know what someone's probably doing at that time when Isaiah's in front of the king? There's a scribe writing it down, right? They have the minutes, right? And then at the end of the day, they'll say, all right, let's review the minutes. Minutes pass, right? How many of you like minutes and reviewing minutes? <laughs> all of those, they, right? But they do it, right? It, this is official business in front of the king. The, these words and promises of God are there. And, of course, we have it written, and it's preserved in scriptures, right? Everyone will hear the word of the Lord from Isaiah. And, of course, I'm sure our King Hezekiah would want to talk about that over and over and over again. Hey, God gave me a sign. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that you know, people do recover from serious illnesses, and by giving a sign, it, it confirms where that recovery came from. Ooh. It wasn't just, I got better because I was going to get better anyway. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it comes from the Lord, right? It's clear evidence that this didn't come from Hezekiah himself, didn't come from his doctor. It came from God, right? Especially when God, like, manipulates his creation, right? Yeah. God, uh, the children of Israel tended to always want to ask God for a sign. Mm. Hezekiah did not even think about it. Mm -hmm. So God said, oh, you're humble enough to not question my words. I will give you a sign, and it's not public. Yeah. And it's a very important sign, that you're not just the shadow, but the sun had to change. Yeah. And as, as we said, this was a very public thing. And what did the Assyrians think? That this was going on in parallel. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And maybe it was like the day before mm -hmm. the angel came. Perhaps. Perhaps. And, and that's why they fled in a panic. I mean, obviously, besides seeing dead bodies all over the place. Yeah, no, no, no. 185,000 dead. How many were left? It doesn't yeah. say. Maybe and and also, like, whoa, what just happened here? Yeah. 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 The guys around the neck were in That's true. Yeah. It's even possible that the. Israelites proclaimed it from the walls to the Assyrians saying, hey, our God has said that he's going to protect us from you, and this will be the sign. And then it happens. Yeah. And then the angel of death comes. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, and they what, what would you think if you were the surviving Assyrians? Right. Especially knowing that their whole tactic was to publicly intimidate everybody, saying, no God can defend you from the king of Assyria and his army. That's what they were publicly saying, right? Uh, misinformation, right? They were sending misinformation, one of the means of power, right? Information to the dime, yes? So, if you dig through all the footnotes in the study Bible, you will learn that uh, Hezekiah's father was commanded by Isaiah to ask for a sign. Ooh, Ahaz! And he refused. Ooh. to ask. So we're hoping perhaps the study Bible indicates that this is a lesson learned uh, because when Hez although when his father refuses to ask for the sign, that's where we get uh, the verse Behold the virgin will shall conceive and bear a son. That's Ooh. the sign that Ahaz's father or Hezekiah's father gives him. Right. So here I ask for a sign? No, I don't want to ask for a sign. I'll give you one anyway. Right. Yeah. In Second Kings Hezekiah actually says to Isaiah, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? So yeah. he does actually ask. There, there may be a, an asking of, yeah, for a sign. Yeah, he learned from Dad. All right. And I think there's one more thing. Notice what God attaches to the sign. Right? Uh, look at verse 7. This shall be the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he has promised. 
What did God promise? To add, to add 15 years to his life and to Defend deliver the them, to deliver the city, right, from Assyria. Does God do the same thing for us? Where he makes a big promise and attaches something visible. Children. Okay. All right. He promises. Yeah. As your children of God, as Lutherans especially, that's our view of the sacraments, right? God takes a big promise, right? A huge promise. He promises the forgiveness of sins. He promises eternal life. He promises salvation, right? He promises to be near you, right? He promises to deliver you, right? And then he gives a sign attached to that. Water in holy baptism. Right? He attaches bread and wine in communion, making that promise. Right? The power of that water, the power of that bread and wine, is not the cleanliness of the water. It's not the power of that bread and wine, is not the taste of the bread and wine, but it's the power of Christ's word and promise. Right? And as we receive that water, and as we eat and drink that bread and wine, we know that there's a promise. The promise of our forgiveness. The promise that Jesus makes and does the very things that he says. Right? And, and that pattern you can see throughout the whole Old Testament, even before the sacraments. Right? God makes promises and then he has them do something, or he gives something visible that they can see, taste, touch, feel, right? To assure them of our faith, just like in the sacraments. He creates and assures us in our faith through baptism, communion, or as we hear that word, forgiveness. Those are the blessings of the sacraments. All right. Any questions? Here we go. All right, title. I think we can get to the title, and then I think we'll call it there. All right, so uh, can someone read verse 9 from Isaiah chapter 38, verse 9? A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. All right. Um, so the title given in that, uh, I'm assuming that's ESV. Uh, the title of the song is A Writing. A writing of Hezekiah. All right. Does anyone have anything different in their Bibles? Canticle. Uh, ooh, a canticle. What's a canticle? I can tickle. <laughs> What's a canticle? It's a piece of music, right? It's a song, right? A lot of times we associate with songs, but it's a music. It's it's a song. It's a poetic song. Yeah. Jesus, hymn, hymn of Thanksgiving. A hymn of Thanksgiving. Yeah. Any other uh, 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 titles? Uh, hymn of Thanksgiving, a canticle, a writing. Anyone else? Yeah. Hymn of Thanksgiving, a canticle, a writing. Hmm. Which one is it? Okay, sure. All right. Um, in, in the Hebrew, it could be one of two things. Uh, the first option is it's a miktav of Hezekiah, which a katav means to write or to put into writing or to decree something. So a uh, possible definition is a writing or something that is literally handwritten. Uh, when we talk about kings, right, it's a royal enactment or edict. It's a writing from the king. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, some Bibles and interpreters will interpret the writing of Hezekiah capital letters, okay? Uh, and we can say that that, def or that uh, interpretation uh, fits with Hezekiah's title, you know, that he's king, and he is writing a decree. So that is totally possible, right? Um, the other option is some Bibles will read a miktam instead of mik 
Tav V, it's a Miktam of Hezekiah. Uh, and we could say it could be just a matter of scribal uh, misinterpretation because uh, the last letter of Miktav is like a three-sided square, right? You're missing one line there. And the M is actually a full square. So it could be just as simple as didn't quite finish the, the square. Uh, and so uh, some will translate it as Miktam as opposed to Miktav. So canticle would be of uh, this interpretation, uh, or hymn of thanksgiving, uh, the Bible translators would use miktam. But if your Bible says writing, uh, it leans toward miktam. So. Um, and the definition of miktam is actually unknown. But we do know that it is a technical term in psalm titles. And it fits really well with uh, what's at the beginning of Psalms 56 to 57. So let's take a look at uh, Psalm 56. Psalm 56. Okay. Psalm 56. Now, you notice the, the thing that all caps, right? You notice that before verse 1, in most English Bibles, before verse 1, you see a whole bunch of words in all caps. Italics. Yours is in italics. Okay, yeah, King James likes italics. Um, other Bibles like uh, all caps. Okay, these are called superscriptions, right? Super meaning they're above. Okay, they're written above something. Okay, so these are Psalm superscriptions. Uh, okay, can someone read superscription Psalm 56? To the wise answer, according to the dove on far off terrors, a mixed of David, when the Philistine seized him in Gath. All right, notice that last sentence, right? A mixed of David, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Okay, now let's look at the superscription in 57. Let's see the superscription of Psalm 57. Does someone read that? To the chief musician, Allah set Mitchell of uh, Mitchell of David when he led, fled from Saul in the cave. Okay. And you notice that last sentence, right? A Mictam of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. Notice the pattern, right? The title, a Mictam. From who? David. And then it gives like a little uh, historical context, right? When he fled from Saul in the cave. And then, first one is the psalm, right? Now, with that in mind, flip back to Isaiah 38, verse 9. Um, let's say... Uh, you got King James there, uh, Carla. Go ahead and read verse 9 again. Hymn of Thanksgiving, the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. Notice the pattern. A canticle or a hymn, right? A miktam. From who? Hezekiah. And then it gave a situation, right? He had been sick and recovered from his sickness. And then, verse 10, boom, the psalm. I also have it, like, indented. Verse mm -hmm. 10 is indented yeah. to show that this is now starting mm -hmm. a different form of writing. Yes. And, and so what you see here is verse 9 can be just like those superscriptions in Psalms 56 and 57. And it seems to be within that same pattern. So there's good reason why, you know, King James and other translations will say a hymn or a canticle, right? Um, as opposed to just a writing. Yeah. Are are all miktams um, about true events? Okay, maybe that's what miktam means, a song about a true event. Perhaps. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's like uh, some of the things we can learn to learn more in heaven. Like a ballad? Yeah. Like yeah. a ballad? Yeah. yeah, could be. Or it could be something a little more specific, which we don't know. Uh, but we know that there seems to be this path. Right? Uh, and so the question is, you know, the style, right? It could be a king's edict, right? It can be Hezekiah's handwritten note to the Lord. Uh, it could be a son of David who also faced the lattice. Right? Because David was the one who sang those miktoms in Psalms 56, 57. And here we have like his great, 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 great grandson doing the same thing. Because he faced the lemmas too. It, it reads more like a song. Mm -hmm. It does. Uh, so yeah, a poet who prayed to the Lord. Or a poetically gifted king who wrote a song. Right? It could be both. It could be both. But just to show for the sake of appreciation. What's so great about this song that he's about to sing? All right. Uh, we got a few minutes. How about we uh, get a little bit into this song? Okay. So, verses 10 to 14. Uh, can someone start us off? I said in the cutting off of my day, I shall go to the gates of the grave, and deprived of the residue of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even though, even the Lord in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. My age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off, I have cut off like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pinning sickness. Pinning sickness. From the day even to night, will thou make an end of me. I reckon till morning that the lion, that as a lion, so will he break all my bones. From the day to the to the night, will thou make me make an end to me. Like a crane or swallow, so did I chatter. I did more than the dove, my eyes fail with looking upward. O oh Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. What shall I say? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, good. All right. So, uh, verse 10. Uh, some translations will also say, I said, in the middle of my days. All right? In the middle of my days, or in the middle of my life, I must depart. And, and most uh, will understand it in terms of, in the middle means in my prime or just past my prime. Uh, in today's parlance, we'd probably say, in my 30s or early 40s. Right? That Hezekiah is responding, I'm in the middle of my days, but what's happening? I gotta leave. And uh, how is verse 10 a thought of sorrow then? How is verse 10 a thought of sorrow? Because he's deprived. He feels deprived. Deprived of? The rest of years. The rest of his years, right? Uh, do people have expectations of how long they should live? Sure. Well, what do you expect? Okay, we expect to try to do. All right. Okay, dear Christian. No, that's good, right? As Christians, we do expect to live eternally. But how about here on earth uh, in this valley of sorrow? Okay. Do we still have expectations to live on earth? Right? What are some expectations that either you or others may have? <laughs> oh, you're, you've seen tables? I've seen the actuarial tables. i got a pretty good idea of what the average is. Okay. We can base things on average, right? We can kind of see, you know, someone has studied and put together all kinds of uh, data, right, to take the average. So what is the average these days for uh, for men in, in America? 76. Okay. 78? If you are 65, the average is... If you're 65, your average is 85. But just in general, right, we'll say 70, 78, mid-70s. Okay. You're expecting over 30 and you're going to make it to a point. I'm where you are in life. Because, um, like, my friend who's in his 90s is not looking to live past 100 because he's seen so many of his friends and people pass away. But... Someone in their 30s might say, oh, man, I want to live to one over 100. Mm. Yeah. Foolish thoughts sometimes, right? 
just like foolish thought of, why did I pass up on naps when I was a kid? <laughs> Like, we'll pass up naps. Little kids, hear me out. Do not pass up naps while you have the chance. Got it, little dude? Little dudes. He catches up at the end, though. You start taking naps again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a man on my street. He's 96. And he walks every day. Up and down. And then, last